content note. In this video, we will dive into pronatalism, the overpopulation myth, the underpopulation myth, and ecofascism and the violence done in the name of these ideologies that specifically target women, racial minorities, and children. Please proceed with caution. Pronatalists fear that falling birth rates in certain developed countries like the United States and most of Europe will lead to the extinction of cultures, the breakdown of economies, and ultimately the collapse of civilization. Now we have an underpopulation problem. Really? Yeah. Yes, as, as soon as societies basically reach a level of modernity where there is prosperity, gender equality, high levels of, high levels of education, populations start to drop below replacement rate. That's a pretty serious problem if it seems like modernity and all the things that we consider to be good, like women's rights, like prosperity, like good quality of life, seem incompatible with flourishing humans. So this is the thing that killed them all? No. Indeed, twas their own hubris that ended their reign, their belief that they were the pinnacle of creation, that caused them to poison the water, kill the land, and choke the sky. In the end, no nuclear winter was needed, just the long, heedless autumn of their own self-regard. Uh, you okay? Yeah, sorry, thought that would sound better than, nah, they just screwed themselves by being a bunch of morons. If we stop having babies, humans will go extinct. That's just a fact of life, and it's pretty scary, right? Especially since numbers-wise, it seems like we're headed down this path. The global TFR, or worldwide total fertility rate, has fallen from an average of 5 births per woman in 1950 to 2.3 births per woman in 2021. The current TFR in the US is 1.7, far below the replacement rate of 2.1. And throughout high-income countries like the US, the birth rate has become extremely low. Namely in Europe, where the TFR in 2022 was 1.46 live births per woman. In Poland and Hungary, the TFR is 1.3 and 1.5 respectively. In Japan, it's 1.3 and in South Korea, it's 0.81. So what are governments doing to solve this crisis of too few? Well, many are attempting to implement pronatalist policies or programs that incentivize couples to have more children. According to the UN, the share of countries with explicitly pronatal policies has risen from 10% in 1976 to 15% in 2000 and to 28% in 2015. Back in 2017, when alarm bells on the population crisis first began to ring, the U.S. Congress spent November of that year considering the child tax credit, a measure that reduces the federal income taxes owed by families with kids. According to Emma Green's article entitled The Rebirth of America's Pronatalist Movement, led by Ivanka Trump, the Trump administration has been softly pushing a child care tax deduction and federal paid maternity leave program. The federal leave program for government employees was implemented in 2019 and gives expecting parents a 12 paid week leave. These programs have been sold as ways to support struggling middle-class families, but they also address another issue, declining birth rates. Lyman Stone, an economist at the U.S. Department of Agriculture who blogs about fertility in his spare time, called this year's downward fertility trend the Great Baby Bust of 2017. In Poland and Hungary, they introduced explicitly pronatalist policies. In April of 2016, Poland introduced the 500 Plus program in which parents could receive a tax-free benefit of 500 PLN or about 120 euros per month for the second and any consecutive children until they reach the age of 18. In 2019, the program was extended to cover firstborn children. In Hungary, there was the CSOK program, which was designed to heavily encourage families to have a third or higher parity child. Married couples who have or plan on having three or more children may be eligible for a 25-year loan up to 10 million HUF or 27,000 USD at a fixed 3% interest rate. In 2019, according to Refinery29, the Prime Minister of Hungary, Viktor Obron, introduced several pronatalist policies. They included housing subsidies for single mothers, 21,000 new nursery places, and state funding for families who need to buy people carriers or family cars. He has also made it so that women with more than four children will be exempt from income tax for life. In South Korea, there's a baby bonus, an in-cash transfer to all legal residents with a newborn or adopted child operated by local governments in South Korea. 
As of 2024, families receive 1 million won or 755 USD for infants up to the age of 1 and 500,000 won or 377 USD for infants up to the age of 2. In Japan, pronatalist policies have been a part of public policy as early as the 1970s. These primarily include subsidies and financial assistance to families, but also family and child care leave. According to scholar Dr. Lee Ma, PhD in sociological demography from Stockholm University and the author of Social Policy and childbearing behavior in Japan since the 1960s an individual level perspective. In 2002, a plan on measures to cope with fewer number of children plus one, known as the plus one plan, was announced. Its intention was to increase husbands' efforts in bringing up fertility. This plan calls on fathers to take leave of at least five days when a child is born. Besides this, flexible working time and shorter working hours are suggested to employed parents with preschool children, and more daycare centers are established to extinguish the waiting queues for services. Today, according to K Go Komodo at Tokyo Dev, fathers can take extended paternity leave for four weeks and then six months for childcare leave. For mothers, childcare leave can last up to one year, and if you can't find a daycare after one year, it can last up to 24 months. With childcare leave, you get 67% of your salary for the first 180 days of leave, with an upper limit of 305,000 yen per month or around 1900 USD. After the first 180 days, 50% will be covered with a limit of 227,000 yen or 1400 USD per month. All of this income is tax exempt. However, even with these programs that have spanned decades at this point, Japan's TFR remains one of the lowest in the world. And it's not the only program that seems to have failed in bringing up fertility rates. Though Poland's 500 plus program seems to have increased the TFR in the short term, it's important to note that this increase was only because the benefit began to include firstborn children, even though it was originally conceived to incentivize parents to have a second or third child. The TFR in Poland today is as low as it was when the program was introduced in 2016, eight years ago. In South Korea, where women can give birth for free and they pay you, plus send you a postpartum care voucher worth 1 million won, the TFR still hasn't changed. If anything, it's gotten lower. Though money can help, low fertility rates aren't just about the money, but also about how we view women's bodies and reproductive rights, gender roles, as well as foreign others. And though Japan and South Korea have realized that fathers need to be free to spend time with their children and be a part of the domestic sphere by lengthening paternity leave, it's still not enough when prevailing sexist attitudes of whose job it is to stay at home with the kids are still enforced, and when you live in a country where the wage gap is the highest in the world. South Korea comes in at number one as far as the gender pay gap goes, with a 34% discrepancy between men and women. When it comes to foreign others and immigration in Europe in particular as a way to solve this population crisis, we see the mask really come off. Hungary Prime Minister Viktor Obron stated in 2019, there are fewer and fewer children born in Europe. For the West, the answer to that challenge is immigration. For every missing child, there should be one coming in, and then the numbers will be fine. Hungarian people think differently. We do not need numbers. We need Hungarian children. Migration for us is surrender. And here is, like I said, where the mask really comes off, where the fear-mongering starts and where eugenics rears its ugly head. It's always a slippery slope when you start talking about the declining birth rate because it's so easy easily devolves into a discussion about how white people are being replaced by inferior races and that women are denying men their god-given right to sex. And though sometimes they say the quiet part out loud, like Obron of Hungary, most of the time it's under the guise of just stating the facts, just crunching the numbers. It's all right there, see? At the end of the day, pronatalism is a perfect facade to advocate for very bigoted ideas and policies, ranging from tightening immigration to restricting women's reproductive rights, because on the face of it, they're not wrong and seem to have actual concerns. The global TFR is declining. If humans don't reproduce enough, who will pay into social security? What about the economy? Who will take care of the elderly? If some countries have less people than others, doesn't that make them vulnerable? If we as humans stop having babies, we will go extinct. So it's only logical that we do something about it, right? But because this argument is so basic, it's also very easy to debunk. Yes, if we stop having babies, humans will go extinct. But do you really think in the near future, we're going to reach a point where people just stop having kids? Do you think humans will ever really just stop reproducing? And why don't you think immigration is a good remedy to this problem, hmm? The United Nations Population Fund has a great infographic that details the problem with this too few narrative that I highly suggest you look at for yourself, but essentially, below zero growth fertility rates have existed in many parts of the world since the 1970s without an attendant decline in population totals. This is because many of these countries typically experience net immigration. 
In fact, over the next few decades, migration is predicted to become the sole driver of population growth in high-income countries. Despite fears that soon there will be too few people to sustain our economy, services, and societies, experts say falling birth rates do not spell disaster. Instead, they're a hallmark of demographic transition and correlate with rising lifespans. Today, the only region in the world expected to experience an overall population decrease in the immediate term between 2022 and 2050 is Europe, where a minus 7% growth is expected. Other regions' populations in Central, South, and Southeast Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean and North America are projected to continue growing, but to reach peak sizes before 2100. According to the Australian government, the world population is projected to increase by more than 2 billion persons by 2050. Of the 2 billion increase in population, 52% is expected to stem from sub-Saharan Africa, which will become the most populous region in the world in the early 2060s. And that's what white pro-nationalists are actually afraid of. Sure, maybe they're a bit worried about the economy and the elderly, but what they actually really fear is being overrun by undesirables. The fact that they can use pronatalism to restrict women's rights is just an added bonus. Pronatalism thus becomes the quintessential Trojan horse to disguise some very dangerous ideas about the future of humanity as they wrap their concerns around virtuous language. They just care about the future of humanity, that's all. And even the more seemingly real economic concerns to be a pronatalist aren't very sound. As Princeton economist Paul Kruger declared via Twitter, low fertility does have economic effects. It means a higher old age dependency ratio, making the safety net harder to afford. It also contributes to secular stagnation. Weak investment demand leads to persistent low interest rates. But the first issue, while real, is often overstated. Remember how retiring baby boomers were going to cause fiscal catastrophe? Well, boomers started hitting 65 in 2010. No catastrophe yet. Kruger ends his thread with this. The economic case for pronatalism is really weak, so you're left with this kind of family values argument. I mean, look at how fatherhood has mellowed out Donald Trump. Or not-so-hidden subtext, the need for more white Christians. Going back to the UN Population Fund, worldwide fertility has fallen, and this is an indication of the increasing control that individuals, particularly women, are able to exercise over their reproductive lives. And this is another reason why many push this narrative that the future of humanity is doomed if we don't reproduce more. It's a way to say that women should stay home and be subservient to men without explicitly saying that. By striking fear into people about inevitable population collapse, it makes it seem only logical that women start to become baby-making machines and further justifies patriarchy and restricting women's bodily autonomy. Depending on what kind of pronatalist you are, you either use God, biological determinism, or the liberal guise that women can and should do it all, raise kids and go back to work, to appeal to whatever follower base suits your needs. If the pronatalists can't win you over with their economic or xenophobic talking points, they can appeal to the rational misogynist. It's simply for the good of the species. At the end of the day, pronatalism and those who invoke it by pushing the too few narrative have not so subtle ulterior motives. It's not just about having more kids to preserve humanity. It's about controlling reproductive rights. Who should have more kids and who should have less? It's about banning immigration from undesirable populations, eugenic policies against disabled people, and at its worst, it leads to eco fascism. This white supremacist subsection of pronatalism declares that human overpopulation is why the earth is dying and the world would be better if we all just died. And though I'm sure some of them do mean a mass human extinction of all peoples, many of them have a little asterisk by all and mainly mean those who are the least fit should die. And by least fit, they mean anyone who isn't white. See social Darwinism. Acts of eco-fascistic violence in the U.S. against racial minorities at the hands of white shooters who believe that immigrants and people of color are ruining the world and that white people need to reproduce more as they're the only ones who aren't overpopulating the world has been happening since the late 2010s. I won't go too into detail here as it's very triggering and violent, but the 2022 Buffalo shooter who murdered 13 civilians, 11 of whom were black, wrote a manifesto embracing the eco-fascist label and believed that the ruling class is using immigration to politically and culturally replace white people. In 2019, when a white nationalist gunman killed 23 people in El Paso, Texas, he left behind a manifesto titled The Inconvenient Truth, blending environmentalism with white supremacy and claiming that dwindling resources justified racist violence. 
If we can get rid of enough people, then our way of life can become more sustainable, the El Paso shooter wrote before murdering 23 people. Many white pro-nationalists are concerned that they're becoming the minority. There's not enough of them, while simultaneously complaining about how black and brown people in the global south are reproducing too much, invading their land through immigration. Those people in the global south are to blame for the loss of our jobs, climate change, and they're a threat to our safety. White nationalists spout this rhetoric without acknowledging that one of the reasons why countries in the global south continue to have high birth rates isn't just because many countries lack proper sex education and contraception and restrict women's bodily autonomy, but also because the white imperial core demands it. Without exploiting entire families, including children, how will corporations ever make and sell enough products for their wealthy clientele? Especially when planned obsolescence and overconsumption is the name of the game. When it comes to climate change, in reality, it's the top 10 richest countries in the world who are killing the planet as they have the largest carbon emissions. According to an Oregon State University, University study that measured the carbon footprint of people in various countries, the carbon emissions of one average American in one year is equivalent to the carbon emissions of about four Chinese people, 20 Indians, 30 Pakistanis, 40 Nigerians, or 250 Ethiopians. Humans aren't the problem. In fact, indigenous people have lived alongside the earth for millennia. It's the way racist and capitalist interests have set up the world that's the problem. But we can't talk about changing the way things work because that would inherently threaten the white patriarchal imperial machine. As Olivia Nader wrote for Population Connection, governments need to actively prepare for population aging and transition to more sustainable economic systems that are not based on the absurd notion of infinite growth. And you'd think that these people who claim to be so smart would realize that these two beliefs of over and under population fundamentally contradict each other, but they don't because they just pick and choose what fits their narrative, anything to maintain their position at the top. We are at a tipping point in humanity's history where we can either choose to make giant systemic changes, abolish billionaires, redistribute the wealth, eliminate debt, and create a more equitable society, or go down the path of extinction as seen in Love, Death, and Robots. Who are you expecting? Elon Musk. In the end, countries and their borders are fake and human imposed. When it comes to global population and fertility, there is an equilibrium. And sure, in some areas of the world, there are much more people than others. It's not equally distributed, and that does affect each country differently. But on a macro scale, one family having 10 kids and one family having one kid doesn't make much of an impact when it comes to the global population total and maintaining the human race. Humanity will be just fine without pronatalist policies or overpopulation alone. Alarmists. And yet, there are some people out there who seem to be determined to spread this message that those in the developed world, aka those in the imperial core, need to reproduce and have as many kids as possible, and not just any kids, but screen their embryos for high IQs. These people claim to make decisions solely based on numbers, tout effective altruism, and say that pronatalist parenting is intrinsically low effort parenting because genetics will lead the way. Nature over nurture. While also thinking it's okay to slap their kids. These are just some of the beliefs of the people who declare themselves the saviors of humanity. So in the rest of this video, I want to dive into Jenny Kleeman's expose for The Guardian about the Collins family entitled America's Premier Pronatalist on Having Tons of Kids to Save the World. We'll be going through the article and talk about why basing your decisions on numbers doesn't work, especially when the numbers you're using are faulty, for example, IQ. But I also want to ask, what do we do with people like this? People who are pseudo-intellectuals, which, okay, fine, you do you but who are also spreading misinformation through their organization and aren't turning on the heat for their kids because they think it's an unnecessary indulgence. Because it's fun and easy to discredit nonsensical arguments, but a little less fun knowing that real children are suffering from these individuals' attitudes towards parenting and children. And that's what I really want to talk about in this video. Not just why pronatalists are wrong, but highlight how these beliefs have real-life consequences. At the end of the day, how do we make the world safer for children and families? How can we make a world where you can choose to have whatever family size you want without shaming or coercion. Is a world like that even possible? Those are just some of the questions I want to pose to you today because even though this video is about pronatalism and the doomed future of humanity, it's more about the kids and adults who are already here that often get so overlooked by these tech bros who claim they can predict the future, but who in reality can't look past their own noses. So without further ado, let's go. So in part one, we delved into the general gist of pronatalism. We talked about what it can be a dog whistle for, 
xenophobia and anti-immigration policies, pro-nationalism, controlling reproductive rights, and at its most extreme, eco-fascism, by spreading this idea that there are too few white people but also too many black and brown people. And we talked about how it leads to tangible violence by those who take this ideology to its logical conclusion. So you'd think that rational, pragmatic, atheistic people like Pennsylvanian couple Malcolm and Simone Collins, who earned degrees in neuroscience, business, and technology policy from St. Andrews, Stanford, and Cambridge, would be wary of pronatalism and this too-few narrative, which can be so easily debunked. But actually, the opposite is true. Malcolm and Simone, parents of four, are the founders of the first pronatalist organization in the world, at least declared on their website. While a few have claimed partially similar motivations, they typically use pronatalism as an instrument to other ideological or religious ends. We take a strict non-denominational stance with a focus on science and data. We are strongly against authoritarian population control policies. Instead of violent coercion, we are voluntarily expansive. We offer support and resources for anyone who has kids or may want them, regardless of race, sexuality, income, or other background. So, on the face of it, they seem very progressive, liberal, and secular. They're opposed to the quiverful movement where parents are encouraged to procreate and have as many kids as possible due to religion. In fact, according to Jenny Kleeman's expose, the Collinses celebrate Future Day instead of Christmas, where the future police come and take their toys, and then they have to write a contract about how they're going to make the world a better place and they get their toys back with some gifts and stuff. They get more gifts when they do whatever they said they're going to do. What does Christmas teach them? Get random toys if you're vaguely good, Simone asks. Rather than procreate because God tells them to, they want to have a minimum of seven children in order to help save the world and have become self-declared truth sayers because it's only logical. Malcolm in particular was inspired to create this foundation after working in South Korea, according to their site. At its current fertility rate for 100 South Koreans, there will be 5.9 great-grandchildren, meaning a 96% population collapse. Coming back to the U.S. was like traveling back in time. It felt like traveling two decades back in time, like I was in some sort of... Uh sci-fi world with three key pieces of information. The first piece of information they came back with was this. Falling fertility rates do not have an organic floor. Rates will keep going down without outside intervention. The second is, even at extreme levels of fertility collapse, the issue will not naturally capture a political landscape. People don't talk about this because it requires social leaders to make unobscurable sacrifices to their lifestyles to address. Okay. And the third is, monoethnic and monocultural countries have the lowest fertility rates while multicultural countries show the most resistance to PGET induced fertility collapse. Stopping immigration hurts rather than helps local population fertility rates. So it seems as though they're aware of how pronatalism is viewed to outsiders as a dog whistle for white nationalism and creating a white ethno state, and they're supposedly staunchly against that, even though they recently shared support for Israel because to them Israel is one of the only developed nations where the birth rate hasn't stagnated. It, it seems wild to me that we live in a world today where not a single country or culture except for maybe Israel has found out how to maintain a stable population alongside prosperity, gender equality, and education. The TFR of Israel is three. In Kleeman's article, they say that they're not into recruitment or coercion. Rather, they just want to encourage people who already are interested in having kids to have more children in order to prevent a South Korea-like catastrophe, as they call it, from happening in the U.S. They seem to understand that governments will need to make changes, but rather than make changes to accommodate a smaller population size with aging members and let people have as many or as little kids as they want, they think governments need to intervene to incentivize people to have more children. And at first glance, that's okay, right? Like maybe people do want to have kids, but find it unattainable due to the growing wealth gap, wage stagnation, medical and student debt, lack of affordable child and health care, long working hours, etc. Wouldn't it be great if the government addressed those things to make it easier for adults to have as many or as little kids as they wanted? But the Collinses are capitalists. They don't want systemic change in terms of letting go of capital and wealth redistribution. Rather, they're self-proclaimed venture capitalists. They run TravelMax.com and turn failing businesses into cash cows. And Simone doesn't take a day off, even after having a C-section. According to Simone, she will have the day of her C-section off because of the drugs, but will take her work calls from the hospital the day after. She tells me it's because she's bored out of her mind when she's stuck with a newborn. In what they hope will be the beginning of political careers for both of them, Simone is actually going to run for Pennsylvania 
California state government as a Republican a few weeks after she's due. According to Malcolm, the number one pronatalist policy position is for governments to make it easier for women to work from home and have flexible hours. The Collinses believe in child care, but not maternity leave. Simone has never taken any. Isn't that wonderful? Malcolm also sees declining birth rates as a result of technologically and financially well-off countries where women have rights. Oh, okay, so if we just take the women's rights away, we'll have more kids. Problem solved. Just reading about these people for a few minutes will tell you who they really are. They may seem all-inclusive, just asking questions, just showing you the data. But in reality, they're just as bigoted and ignorant as outwardly facing bigots calling for an ethnostate. And though they claim to be open to immigration on their website as a way to help population growth, in the interview with Kleeman, Malcolm says the only way countries like ours can survive is through immigration from those very poor countries where birth rates continue to be high. You're outsourcing the labor of child rearing to a separate group, he says and importing people from Africa to support a mostly non-working white population because you didn't put in the labor to support non-working white people has really horrible optics. So you're really only seeing high fertility rates in desperately poor countries right now. If you look- um, That whole thing that you just said has really horrible optics. You're basically saying that immigrants have no potential in the US and that they're just going to end up being child rearing machines. Rather than fighting for policies to help acclimate immigrants to help with education and finding jobs and providing them subsidized housing and free child and health care, Malcolm thinks that we shouldn't rely on immigrants for population growth because it would look bad for him as a white person to have black immigrants potentially serving him in low-wage jobs as those are the only positions he thinks they're equipped for. If you kick every Latino out of this country, then who is going to be cleaning your toilet, Donald Trump? Oh, that's... And though the Collinses claim that their version of the new right and pronatalism has nothing to do with bigotry and that it's just about numbers, they have no problem screening their embryos for low or high IQs, a number grading system to measure perceived intelligence that has been debunked for decades. You can't make logical decisions based on numbers when the numbers themselves are based on specifically racist falsehoods and don't encompass the totality of human intelligence. In general, General, the Collinses sure care a lot about genes. That's why they're such low effort parents. Genes will lead the way. It doesn't matter that my two toddlers have iPads around their necks. I selected them to be smart, so they'll just be smart. Kleeman notes both boys have their own iPads fitted with a strap so they can wear them around their necks. Two year old Torsten is alone somewhere with his. As Kleeman writes, for pronatalists like the Collinses and tech bros who declare they know better than everyone else like Elon Musk, Sam Altman, and Skype billionaire Jan Talon who donated half a million dollars to the Collinses, life on Earth is a numbers game. Focus on producing the maximum number of heirs, not to inherit assets, but genes, outlook, and worldview. That doesn't sound the least bit eugenics-y. People like the Collinses also follow effective altruism, which has its epicenter at places such as Oxford and Silicon Valley, where they believe that a lot of money in the hands of a knowledgeable few who allocate their money into various charitable organizations is the best way to be rich while also helping humanity rather than actually giving the money directly to those who need it. They think that they can create change from the inside. According to Brian Berkey, Associate Professor of Legal Studies and Business Ethics at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, effective altruism has moved away from using hard evidence to address humanitarian crises in real time with simple philanthropic solutions. Instead, it has begun to favor advancing abstract and long-termist views, such as averting AI-driven catastrophe and nuclear war. For future-focused tech billionaires, preventing runaway AI may seem more interesting than transferring huge amounts of wealth to poorer people on the other side of the world. Malcolm said to Kleeman in their interview, he considers the suffering of humans today to be pretty irrelevant because the suffering of billions of future humans could be eliminated if they succeed in creating a technophilic interplanetary species. Although there is power in the philosophy, Joshua Hobbes, a lecturer and consultant in applied ethics at the University of Leeds, UK, says, Effective altruism is flawed in that the movement seeks to change those already in positions of power. Effective altruism can underestimate the role of environment in shaping a person's character and motivations. That's where nurture comes in. But it seems as though the Collinses don't really care too much about that as Malcolm sees fit to slap and hit his children as a way to discipline them. When they were rightfully called out for the way they use corporal punishment against their toddlers for discipline, they call the criticism racist because black and brown people who use corporal punishment don't get the same hate they do. Simone said in response to the criticisms, We are kind of shocked by the racism threaded throughout this recent controversy. 
It's pretty well documented that African Americans and other minority groups practice corporal punishment much more than other groups. So much for being self-aware white people. Before I end the section, I just want to emphasize that for a couple who claims to want to have as many kids as possible to save humanity, they don't seem to really like or care about them. All three kids share a bedroom and sleep on a stack of bunk beds where the youngest one looks like they could easily roll off of it, while Simone and Malcolm have their own bedrooms and Simone has her own office. The kids' bedroom is actually in Malcolm's office. They don't even get their own bedroom, even though the parents again get their own bedrooms and the mom gets her own office. Why don't the two parents share an office and then each get their own bedroom and then they'll have one dedicated room for the children so they don't need to sleep in their dad's office. They also give them seemingly unlimited and unsupervised screen time, don't bundle them up in an unheated house, and let them play unsupervised in the backyard when they're all under five years old. Having one toddler is hard. I can't imagine taking care of four under four while working and homeschooling with no maternity leave. They say they own a second house where the tenants need to do childcare instead of paying rent. And I'm curious, how does that work? Are these people used to dealing with toddlers? Are they trained at all to work with kids? If they don't wanna give childcare, can they not live in your house? (laughs) Taking care of kids is a full-time job in and of itself. Are they just unemployed, these people? (laughs) Taking care of kids is a full-time job in and of itself. When you become a parent, the first few years are about surviving, connecting, and not really parenting or disciplining, but just getting to know this being and helping them through the first few years. It's a vital time, and they just seem like they don't really have time to dedicate to their children. Not to mention that these little kids are living in a house where guns are openly on display. The parents are so focused on this hypothetical future and raising the next generation of geniuses and protecting humanity, they're not at all worried that they might be biting off more than they can chew. And if they think it's okay to hit their toddlers, how do they treat each other? How do they treat other grown adults? As a fellow parent, I'm trying not to be so judgmental. I'm sure they love their kids to death, but you cannot and should not hit your kids. They're not tigers. You're not a tiger. We're humans and we don't do that. In the article, they did say that they had CPS called on them because the kids were playing outside unsupervised when they're again all under five years old. Nothing came of it and I don't think that taking their kids away from them or sending them death threats is the answer, but I also don't think that simply talking to them will make them see the error in their ways when it comes to parenting. I think the only thing we can do as onlookers is just to be nicer to kids in general. You never know what a kid is going through, if they're getting hit at home, if they're being neglected, etc. If you see a kid misbehaving or they're annoying you in public, don't roll your eyes or scoff. Just know that they're not trying to give you a hard time, they're having a hard time. If you have a kid in your life, like a niece or a nephew or a cousin, check in on them. Be a safe, trusted adult that's just there to listen. In addition, try to help out parents in your life too. Check in on them if you know any. Or if you don't, maybe you see a parent with their hands full. Offer to hold the door open for them. If you see a parent drop something, pick it up. Be that kind stranger that offers a helping hand if you're able to. Those are the things we can do on an individual level. But I think as a society, we need to be checking up on kids more and also check in on parents because kids are still being hit today by their parents who probably need therapy or a break or just need to take a parenting and early childhood education class. Parenting is something that's so private in the U.S. because it's something that's so individualized rather than communal. But in reality, kids should have multiple adults that they feel like they can go to and feel safe with, not just their parents, because some parents aren't safe to be around. I think making parenting and early childhood development classes mandatory for soon-to-be parents or for parents in general would be extremely helpful in stopping corporal punishment. Letting parents know what's actually in their toolbox, what they can use when dealing with their toddlers, kids, preteens, and teens. Parenting isn't something that comes naturally. Working with kids and teens is something you need to actually study. In addition, having free child care centers that are open on weekends and also during the week would be great to give frustrated and tired parents a break, as well as get more adults in the community involved with kids and getting to know the parents in the community. Not to mention it would reduce screen time and create a safe environment for kids to interact with other kids for a few hours. Parents, at least in the U.S., have so much control over their children's lives. They can say whether they go to school or not, what they're taught, if they have access to TV or the outside world, what books they can read. Children from pronatalist families who are homeschooled and live in an echo chamber lead such insular and private lives 
which is the exact opposite of how they should be living. Children should be integrated in a diverse community and have many trusted adults around them. And though the Collinses say they're pro-multiculturalism, they're also set on homeschooling and are only having kids because of this theoretical dystopian future they've convinced themselves is imminent, not because they actually love to be around children and want to get to know them. Malcolm says in the article about how they're able to afford so many kids is because they don't spoil them by heating the house or giving them their own room. They don't treat them like retired millionaires, and yet he's okay with them wearing iPads around their necks. I think the only way to help kids like Malcolm and Simone's kids is to get the community involved, not the police, not CPS, but create places where kids and parents can go to get to know their neighbors and maybe make it mandatory. And to also make parenting classes mandatory, again, if you have a young child, to let the community know we don't tolerate hitting. And to teach the children that if your parent does that, it's not okay and that you can come to us if that happens. It would also open up kids to other family dynamics to have something to compare themselves to. Because when you live in an insular community like a pronatalist community, that's all you know. Having free childcare centers and mandatory parenting classes and playgroups would at least force the parents and kids to see other points of view, even if they don't become friends or change their ways, and also would be a way to survey the community to make sure parents aren't abusing their positions of power. So in this video, we delved into what pronatalism is a dog whistle for and how it's a very convenient way to get across very dangerous ideas ranging from restricting women's rights and bodily autonomy to xenophobia and limiting immigration to eco-fascism. We also did a deep dive into the faces of pronatalism in the US, or at least the self-declared ones, Malcolm and Simone Collins, and came to the conclusion that though they sound more rational, progressive, and liberal compared to mask off bigots, they're really not any difference. When push comes to shove, they're just posturing as liberals who think that reverse racism is real. In reality, their vision of the new right is just as horrible as any other current right-winger. They just think they're smarter than those stupid rednecks, which is why they try to set themselves apart by being numbers-focused. They're not the dumb type of backwoods conservative with a southern accent. They're well-dressed, highly educated eugenicists. In all, we as a society just need to take better care of children and parents. We need to address parenting as a child care position because simply having a child doesn't make you a qualified caregiver. We need community-based mandatory parenting classes and child care because no one can parent alone and no child should be left in the dark. I hope one day we can implement these larger societal and communal changes like free child care centers for parents, free mental health care for kids and parents, and also do communal check-ins where attendance is mandatory and where no one is allowed to be an island and keep their child isolated. But for now, just try to be nicer to kids on an individual basis and offer a helping hand to a parent if you know any. Be as involved as you can or want to be in the upbringing of small ones because it's not something any adult should be doing alone. And kids deserve as many loving and supportive adults as possible in their lives. So that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, please give it a like, leave a comment. And if you're interested, become a patron to help support the channel. And thank you so much again, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.